my name is Brian Pride, and my presentation is looking at how advocacy influences food security programming and the various frameworks. Uh, next slide, please. I spent the first year of my fellowship as an agriculture technical advisor with a food aid organization called Rise Against Hunger. The primary objective of Rise was to send packaged meals of rice, dehydrated vegetables, and make micronutrients to countries in South Sudan, Zimbabwe, and Mali. Rise Against Hunger started to diversify how they engaged in food and secure communities by developing a funding model that empowered local NGOs to design and implement resilience projects. The resilience projects highlighted the ability to transition communities from food aid recipients to agriculture resilience implementers. I helped design a Rise Resilience project at a locally operated orphanage and school called Hope for South Sudan. Next slide, please. Twice a year, Hope for South Sudan would transport six months worth of RISE meals to support 400 students that lived on campus. Transporting meals was a treacherous multiple day journey and the school staff was vulnerable to highway robberies, transportation wreckages and rains that washed roads away for weeks at a time. The transportation alone demonstrated how food aid was not a sustainable solution and how it was time for Hope for South Sudan to grow food on campus. The school staff doubted their ability to grow enough food because the year prior, they had cultivated three acres of land and each acre yielded roughly 137 pounds of food per acre, which was nowhere near the amount of food that they would need to feed the students. Together with Hope for South Sudan staff, we designed a conservation agriculture project. The first stage of the project was to expand the previously cultivated three acres to 30 acres. And our first harvest of the 30 acres yielded 443 pounds of food per acre. It was an 800% increase from the year prior and enough food to feed students for three months. The harvest was empowering and it demonstrated the impact of the supporting the staff with teaching conservation agriculture and soil rehabilitation techniques, rather than supporting the school with food aid. By adding a locally led process, Rise Against Hunger is supporting Hope for South Sudan in achieving food security. The Hope for South Sudan project reflects concepts of localized and locally led develop development, empowerment of community leaders, building local ownership, all of which were recommendations made by my colleagues here today. My colleagues shared why adapting, adopting these recommendations will improve international development practices. But what I'm sharing with you is one, how we can change our current advocacy process to ensure that recommendations similar to the ones made by my colleagues are heard. And two, how incorporating these recommendations within US foreign assistance will eradicate hunger. And it starts with decolonizing our advocacy. Next slide, please. The second year of my fellowship, I worked as a policy fellow with Interaction, an advocacy coalition of 200 plus international NGOs that work to eliminate hunger, extreme poverty, strengthen human rights, and promote climate action. My first assignment was writing recommendations to USAID on the Global Food Security Strategy Refresh and Feed the Future initiatives. I participated in consultations hosted by USAID with different INGOs, private sector investors, think tanks, policy advocates, and representatives from US, uh, from US government agencies. While there were many opportunities to provide feedback on the refresh, the opportunities catered to those that were based in the US. There were very few in-country Feed the Future representatives providing recommendations. The most underrepresented group were field teams and implementers with firsthand lived Feed the Future implementing experience. These were by far the most valuable perspectives and they were missing from conversation. Next slide, please. As a response, I and the public policy team at Interaction changed our advocacy process. We hosted an Elevating Local Perspectives consultation and invited local and regional experts implementers to provide recommendations for the global food security strategy refresh. 
During the consultations, local and regional implementers shared that many of the communities wanted Feed the Future programming to prioritize indigenous crop cultivation and ask for assistance to document different indigenous leafy green vegetables. Participants expressed that they were uninterested in receiving U.S. food commodities as a primary form of foreign assistance. In consultations with predominantly D.C.-based participants, many of the recommendations that were made encouraged to increase U.S. commodities shipped abroad. Another contrasting recommendation was how local and regional implementers expressed that Feed the Future Innovation Labs often lacked local context, therefore making the innovations not as effective or as irrelevant as they could be. Yet in DC based think, yet DC based think tanks and researchers advocated for funding increases to the Feed the Future Innovation Labs because the technologies were perceived to be life-changing for farmers abroad. When consultations are not accessible to local and regional implementers, DC opinions overshadow the insight of those who are living closest to the hunger that we are trying to eradicate. At Interaction, we intentionally diversified the stakeholders we were listening to. The change in process made us better policy advocates, and the recommendations we wrote to USAID were strengthened due to the difference in ideas gathered from the consultation groups. In total, we hosted six elevating perspective consultations for strategies including the GFSS, USAID Climate Strategy, and the EU Food Systems Summit. Next slide, please. Over 300 people registered to participate in consultations. We were communicating with implementers across multiple countries and multiple languages. The Elevating Local Perspective consultations provided a platform for those who live closest to the problem of hunger to influence the global food security strategy refresh. We were practicing advocacy that gave voice to the people whom our conversations were often just about. The exclusion of those who live closest to hunger from conversations about ending hunger is modern day colonialism. And it expresses the idea that the West knows best discrediting the expertise of global South experts. It's time we change our process and bring those who are directly impacted by our policy decisions to our policy conversations. We have the tools, the resources and the technology to end hunger. But until we change our process and, inter and until we ensure that all stakeholders are represented, we will continue to be stunted in our approaches to eradicating hunger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, now opening up to any questions the audience. So we do have some, um, some of the work that I've been working on at Interaction is we've actually been preparing a best practices guide that outlines how to conduct these different types of consultations that are really elevating the perspectives of those who are living closest to hunger. One of the recommendations that I would like to make is individuals taking a look at how they too can also be involved and help elevating these perspectives to make sure that we're amplifying the voices that will live closest to the hunger and make sure that our policy decisions actually reflect the, uh, the needs of the people on the ground. And Brian, we have a couple of questions in the chat yeah. uh, from Meg. Is there a long-term plan to connect hope for South Sudan and other local bro growers in order to provide a local safety net for when there are bad harvest years? Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that we can also say is that the recommendations we had submitted uh, to USAID on how to actually strengthen this representation of local leaders within the uh, global food security strategy framework was actually reflected within the refresh release that we got a few weeks ago. Um, and so with that, one of the things that we also saw in those recommendations is the fact that there is going to be a stronger emphasis on looking at early warning systems and figuring out how to help different farmers approach more of a multi-sectorial approach to food security programming. And so my hope 
is that with uh, these recommendations within the refresh and with also more of us trying to find ways to elevate these perspectives, that we can start seeing a standardized practice of including these perspectives with any of the frameworks that we are trying to implement. Go down the list here. Did you interview anyone working on USDA McGovern Dole projects? One of the things that I've been working on is actually um, conducting a survey to collect feedback from all of the participants that participated in the conservation uh, consultations. We did work closely with USAID and other USG agencies to have their involvement within the consultation process. So they are folks that we are also touching base with to get more feedback on how they perceived the recommendations that we submitted. But what I will also just say is that I, we can see a significant impact and change in the refresh uh, document that was released because so many of the ideas were actually reflected from the consultations, which I think tells us that the ideas were, were heard, also perceived well, and noticed the relevance to uh, the food security strategy framework. Great, hey, and last question. How did you find and solicit the local part uh, participants in your consultations, and why do you think more advocacy organizations aren't applying these practices? Uh, luckily for interaction, we're a coalition of about 200 different INGOs, so we really pulled together with our member organizations to help um, elevate the perspectives of those that were implementing Feed the Future programming and other projects on a field level. Uh, this was definitely possible with our member organizations. We're still identifying a few areas where um, there's a reliance on member organizations to elevate these perspectives. And that's also something that we're grappling with and something that we're aware is hindering true representation of local leaders. And so this is something that we're trying to identify and figure out how to work around and also bolster those opinions. So that way um, our implementers don't have to rely on their host organizations to actually turn around and invite them to these types of consultations.